There is a cat on my lap. I think this is going to happen every, every time I get together with people. It's going to be like, oh, I'm part of the conversation too. Some of you know each other or know me pretty well, but us being all together in one place, that's, that's new. So Dawn, I'm going to start with you. If you would tell us how you would love to have your name pronounced, your last name especially, and just tell us one thing about your endeavors or interests or whatever comes to mind that we, you'd love us to know about you. Okay. Well, my name is Don Auction. I don't expect anyone to get it right because it's been 71 years now and very few people get it on the first pass. But uh, I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I'm a septuagenarian, and uh, having achieved that status, I started writing a weekly newsletter with a, uh, a podcast called The End Game, uh, and it's about aging positively. And if this is our chance to do Hollywood Squares, I would like to play Paul Lind. <laughs> <laughs> no, no lie. That was spoken by my husband and I last night. We said, is this Brady Bunch? Or I said, Hollywood Squares. And he goes, you are not Paul Lind. So we have Paul Lind. <laughs> Please. Oh, my goodness. Who else do we have in Hollywood Squares tonight? <laughs> I hear someone laughing. That's me. I'm Charlotte uh, Kenny Joseph. And I'm a writer and educator. I'm a pain science enthusiast, and um, I am married cross-culturally and spent half of my married life in India, raising kids and caring for elders in India, and I'm back in the States now. Wow. I call on Maxwell. Uh, my, name is, my name is Maxwell Cohen. I'm based in New York City. I started my business in college originally to solve one of my pain points, and it turned out to be a terrific solution for the elderly community. Also, uh, the beginning of life community, uh, from potty training to elder elderly, I've learned, and I'm sure you guys could you know, uh, take it from there, that there's two stages of life are very similar as they both require a lot of care. And it seems that my product has dramatically helped the caregivers and in has improved patient comfort. I love that. Max, who do you tag? I tag Tim. All right, well, thank you. Uh, I'm Tim McDonald. I live in Tampa, Florida, and I am a stage four colon cancer survivor with uh, meds to my liver and uh, pursuing a liver transplant, um, which was hopefully going to happen in the next couple months. Uh, and I can rid my body of cancer, uh, just after being told I had three years to live. So, um, pretty excited about that, but more importantly, I think why I shared that was it's really driving me to help more people become aware of becoming a living liver donor and helping metastasize cancer patients that are going for liver transplants through the process and help match them with living donors. So, Miriam, I guess you knew All it was right. coming to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm it now. Well, my name is Miriam Haugen. I'm in Oregon. Um, and I am a photographer and uh, I fancy myself an entrepreneur. And uh, I have some, and a grandmother. And I, I, this whole aging thing, I have a little bit of mixed feelings about. There's some things I love about it and some things that I don't love about it. And, um, and I'm still trying to come to terms with all of that, but very, but enjoying life. And uh, so that's, I think the positive thing is I am really at a stage where I'm enjoying life tremendously. Awesome. I, as far as I'm concerned, everyone here is an aging enthusiast because you're either looking forward to what will sustain your living, you are looking forward to even just the fall colors. So we're all we're all 
enthusiastically or, or working hard or looking happily into our future. And, and we, we all have these purposes going on and these things that, that we're looking at, including some people writing. And Dawn, you said, did you say that you celebrated your, your 70th birthday by starting to write? Uh, that's, that's pretty much true. Um, I've always been a writer of one kind or another, but uh, th what I've started is writing for myself and writing for my audience, which is people wow. about our age. And it's been a really delightful thing. Uh, one, one thing I want to say about the aging process, uh, since I agree that you can have mixed feelings about it, mm -hmm. one of the the things that has turned me positive over time is that I've come to grips with a lot of my irrational fears, uh, particularly the fear of uh, Alzheimer's, which, yeah. to, which to me is the, the, the biggest boogaboo now, even more than cancer, with apologies to Tim, uh, because cancer can be cured, but Alzheimer's can't be. And okay. as soon as... Well, yeah, and as soon as as soon as you forget what level in the parking garage you put your car, or you can't remember uh, who was your fourth grade teacher, you start saying, "Oh my God, is it Alzheimer's? Oh my God, am I losing it?" And uh, I realized I was going back through some old notes. I was reacting that way ten years ago, and um, it hasn't done me any good. And I've I've come to realize that a lot of that is just normal. Uh, your hard drive is full. It's harder to access the random bits of information inside because there's more uh, neurons to go through. Your processor is a little slow and it's normal and don't worry about it. It's not, it's not anything that's going to, going to get to you. It almost feels like an old computer as it, you know, as the, as the megabytes and the gigs and the RAM all get depleted. Exactly. And it moving a little slower than usual. I was going to say, Don, I love that you started with irrational fear because I always talk about the difference between irrational and rational fears. But mm -hmm. it, it, it brings up a book that I read once that I was gifted um, by a friend of mine called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And it's all because humans are one of the only species on our planet that has the capacity to project what might happen. And our ego does a hell of a job trying to convince us that a lot of our irrational fears are rational. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, it does. <laughs> I'm a smart it. person. So if I'm scared of this, there's a reason. Right. Exactly. That, I heard a, a very powerful phrase from a colleague of mine who's a, um, a, a mental health uh, expert. She said, dread ahead. <laughs> I was like, I began to dread ahead. And I stopped myself, she said. And I was like, okay, yes, let's not do dread ahead. It's not necessary. Is there anything today that alleviates these elderly getting older fears or the irrational irrational things that pop up just inevitably therapy helps <laughs> oh, i i was going to say one of the things that helped me immensely i almost do this like subconsciously now but i had to be very conscious of it when i first started doing this was i'd have a conversation with my fear and mm -hmm. kind of like you write a screenplay you don't know what you're going to say or what the conversation is going to be. You kind of let it just come out naturally. It, but I'd actually write it down like a script and say fear and me. And I'd always open by asking if I could talk with it. I'd ask it questions about, you know, based upon what it was telling me. Um, I know this might sound a little goofy, but um, <laughs> it really helped. Um, and what it was telling me was based upon past experiences. But what I always reminded my fear about during most of these conversations was that it tried to prevent me from doing that before. I actually had something good come from it. Is it willing to give me a chance to explore this? And usually it says yes. And I always thank it. And 
ask it if I can come back if it comes up again, or if I can apologize and say I was wrong. And now I just kind of have those thoughts, like, you know, it used to take like a half an hour scripting it out 15 minutes. Now it just like happens like within a minute in my head, just like without me even thinking I need to be doing it, you know? <laughs> I think that's great. Um, I have those same kind of dialogues with um, what I call the, um, the inner critic which is that voice that tells me how stupid I am all the time and how I shouldn't even think to take a risk. And so we have those dialogues. And at the end, I say, thank you for looking out for me. I appreciate your wanting the best for me. Shove it. <laughs> <laughs> Respectfully. Oh, for me. Scott and I had a similar. Yeah, I'm go not, ahead. I'm not here at 60 and I've uh, had issues with my short-term memory since uh, since my kids were small mm -hmm. and I was sleep deprived. And um, oh, yeah. I have just learned for me, I, I'm not a surfer, but for me, I've a, done a little bit of swimming in the ocean. And for me, it's just like, I'm just riding the waves and mm -hmm. I, I'm right now and I'm moving forward. And if I am forgetting something that's important to me, I find a strategy for that. But I'm not. I'm just. I'm just here and now. And and I, I, you know, it's been almost twenty years, and I'm still functioning. So hey. <laughs> yeah, I often uh, say that you know who would know if I had Alzheimer's because I've always had a bad memory. But um, <laughs> I think my one of my fears is of being irrelevant. I don't know if anybody or or so out of touch. I, I look at some of um, my peers and people that are, you know, a little bit older that uh, they've been out of the workforce. They don't know modern technology. They, you know, just opening their email becomes a, uh, a challenge. And I'm going, I am never going to be that person. I'm determined never to be that person. <laughs> and so anyway. But thankfully, I'm in a I'm in a technical enough field that I'm being forced to learn things all the time. So um, so that helps. But but we'll see. At some point, I probably will start slacking off, and then I'll start losing touch. <laughs> I have some people caught disregarded. Yeah, I don't want to be disregarded. I don't want people to go. It's okay. We'll take care of it. This is kind of a little too complicated for you. And oh, that makes me so mad. <laughs> no, it's not too complicated. I can do this. I have a theory then because technology keeps changing so fast and our software providers love to keep changing things mm -hmm. that eventually the the effort that it's going to take to keep up with the more complicated software um, is going to maybe not pay off for me. Yeah. And so when I make long range, like what, what, what am I going to work with purpose at 20 years from now? I'm thinking of like, I want stuff that where I can draw more on my life experience and my lived wisdom and not rely so much on um, knowing the latest features of the software. That's a very good, very wise, very wise. I've learned as a young entrepreneur, you have to keep things both ways. You do the old school way and mix it with the, the new school way. The new school is never always right because as you said, it's you know, the people that run it, it the software is changing so quickly that they can't even keep up with it. And then the old school way is based off of wisdom and knowledge of you know, some of the advisors, my father and my mother that I work with. Um, just, you know, business is hard. And the crazy part is some of the hard parts for me are just normal everyday business for somebody who's been there, done that. So just an example, my container is late. I, as a young entrepreneur, a few years ago, I would make it a big deal. And, you know, my advisors would say, Maxwell, they're always late. And <laughs> you just have to prepare for those things, even before the pandemic, when supply chain was, you know, somewhat um, lubricated. 
And now I've learned, you know, it has to be a healthy mix of both. And that goes back to the relevancy thing as well. Keep your knowledge and experience. But, you know, one of the biggest compliments I told, um, I believe it was around 70 years old, is you're so relevant. And that was, as you mentioned, his number one compliment that he could have received. Um, so it's about using the new and old technology. And I've learned that the elderly new companies coming into the space are too fancy and too much VR, AR. I don't, I don't even know how to use these things. And so we're skipping, you know, instead of using a cell phone and iPad, we're going beyond. And so I think when it comes to technology adoption, the elderly community is getting bombarded by robots, by things that talk, uh, things you put over your head. And I think it's about keeping things, not stupid simple, but keeping things smart simple. I like I was, that. I was going to say one of my philosophies mm -hmm. is I teach by learning and I learn by teaching. And it's a, a healthy mix to, you know, whether we're talking about technology or just anything else in life that, you know, we all have something to give but we all have something to learn and it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. <laughs> and that's what I think keeps me going and why I love being around people that are older than me and people that are younger than me <laughs> because everybody's got a different perspective and even not just age, but like outside of what we know, you know, I mean, uh, I, you know, I know, you know, I've traveled overseas and it was called an American <laughs> it was so American. <laughs> and um, I asked what that meant. And they explained that I just had to have an answer for everything. Mm -hmm. And I went back yeah. the next time with that same client. And I took a different approach. Instead of having an answer for everything, I asked a lot more questions. And then gave suggestions instead of answers. Mm -hmm. And I said, so was I less American this time? And they said, oh, definitely, for sure. <laughs> but I, I only share that story because it really helped what I brought back to my life and how I live it. It's like, I don't try and come up with the answer for everything. I try and ask questions that help me maybe provide suggestions, but not give them an answer because the answer is going to be different for each one of us, you know, depending on our situation. And so it's just giving what I know and sharing it, but not telling somebody how to be. I think wow. remaining curious is really important. And like you're you're asking questions, I think listening and and when uh, when something just totally different outside of my experience comes into the world, into society, remaining curious about it, not just saying, Well, this is the way I know, but why? What is it like? Hmm. I I certainly feel like it's very important for us as we're older to keep learning stuff and to keep being curious. Um, that said, that doesn't mean we have to desperately figure out every new technology as it comes along, only insofar as it helps us with what we care about knowing and what we want to further. So my personal tech strategy has been to make a lot of younger friends. <laughs> yes. And my strategy after realizing how hard life and business is, is to make friends with the older people. Um, you know, you guys were born in, I don't want to sound rude, in like the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And I couldn't even imagine, you know, the lives that you lived and how you guys grew up and, you know, being either first generation or, you know, in this crazy world we live in. And what I've learned about traveling overseas and something I admire is that being old is not being old. It's um, almost a right to, um, you know, accomplishment of life where, you know, elderly community overseas is much more highly regarded and not just pushed away or just a business. You know, families live together from, you know, four generations in one household in many cases. And i don't know how you guys grew up, but I, you know, during COVID, I lived with my entire family, you know, my little nephews, my parents, um, you know, my sisters and brothers, just, you know, for extended periods of time and cross the board, mental health, staying sharp, helping around the family, taking care of the kids when, you know, they want to go out. That's 
what, in my opinion, you know, how getting older should be. I know that my father and mother watching the children run around in circles, literally just circles, is the greatest joy <laughs> after 70 years of their you know, existence on planet Earth. So I think they're, you know, that keeps you relevant. It keeps you sharp because these kids are so smart these days. Um, you know, they ask such funny questions, but they remember everything you say. So, you know, it keeps you young. It keeps you smart. It keeps you silly from everything I've seen. I love it. I love it. Old to me sometimes is a culture, a different place, a uh, Oh, um, a way that you're doing something that everyone knows. Oh, oh, you know, that, that person's older, let's listen to them. Or this person, um, is coming in with experiences that will help us. And I'm thinking if, if I'm going to a different culture, I know I'm a, I'm about to land somewhere and I have two choices and one is, a uh, uh, manual written by someone that I don't really know. And my other choice is a person who has been there very recently and uh, has spent some time there. So I just, you know, and my natural choice would be, I want to talk to this person. It's like, when you get off the plane, what's the first thing that you do or what will I experience or whatever. And, you know, as I age or as, as I get to, to have the privilege of getting to your point, what can I expect? So I had that opportunity. That's probably why I call myself the aging enthusiast because I had, I had that opportunity with people. The youngest was 76. Um, there were a few people over a hundred because I was hired as an in-home caregiver. And I, wow, to just listen to what they used to experience, but to also be trusted to be told, this is what it's like right now for me. This is how I feel. This is what I'm bothered by. This is what I feel I'm very clever at. Um, at, and at my age, I just, love the culture of someone beyond me who was born before me. So I get really enthusiastic about my own aging because I hope I get to do that. I hope I get to turn around and say, hey, I can tell you what it's like to be me, to have lived through this many decades. I, ugh, I get so excited listening to all of you. Keep talking. <laughs> I've learned from, you know, one years old to about 26 years old. It's just constant learning and mistakes. But beyond that, you know, you guys have a full lifetime, literally double my lifetime of straight iterating on what you've learned. So it's always so fun to pick, you know, the brains of everybody. And everybody has some wild story um, that they've got through. You know, whether it was going to war or being first generation, not speaking the native language, um, some bizarre, cool, fascinating, painful, good, amazing stories. And you're still, I still admire it because you're here smiling and enjoying your life after all of that chaos has happened. I got to, I got to tell you one of my favorite, you know, things I hear is when I'm on with younger people and they say, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. And, and my and I'm just like so am I. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I mean, what I was ten years ago is not who I am today, and what I'm going to be in another ten years is not who I'm going to be, you know, today either. So it's like it just. I think when you have that good outlook and that you know that way of listening, learning, and applying to yourself, it's it just you never know where you're going to end up or where, which direction it's going to take you. And that's a beautiful thing about life for me is like, if I was stuck in, I've always said, and I'm not putting anybody down that had like a factory job or a repetitive job, because I know that there are people that that's what fuels them. That's what gives them purpose. But for me, if I was doing one of those jobs, I would drive myself crazy because after about three days, I'd want to know what else I could do. And, <laughs> and so I think this way for me is just the right never the same. Every day is different. Every day is changing. Every day I'm learning something new. I mean, I've, you know, I mean, I've talked to so many people about this waiting process for 
finding a donor. And it's like putting, you know, I have become very good at accepting and being patient with things that I can't control. And this is one thing that I cannot control. I can do what I can do, but I can't do everything. You know, I can't make it happen. And so the longer it gets, though, the tougher it is. And the more I want to beat myself up over the fact that oh, I'm so frustrated, I'm so down, when is this going to happen? And then I just need to have one of those conversations again with myself and remind myself, let it go. You're close. You're so much closer than you were a week ago, a month ago, six months ago. It's going to happen. Have faith, trust everything that you've done is, is going to make it happen. But it doesn't mean that I have everything figured out. I'm an expert because I'm continually learning these new things. And post-transplant, I'm going to learn what it's going to be like to be a, a recipient of a living organ in, your, in my body. And that comes with a whole new set of challenges of taking medication every single day and not being able to have any more alcohol. Not that I've been drinking a lot since I was diagnosed, but you know, I mean, it's just, it's things that I've just been used to that I know are going to be completely different, but I'm not focused on that right now because I'm not there yet. And so it's just this process of going through that is I think why I enjoy his life so much is it's never the same day you know, from one day to the next. And I think as soon as I start feeling that, I look for something to change in my life because that's what keeps me feeling younger. <laughs> Yay. There's, there was some talk about fear and with aging, sometimes comes memory challenges. It's been about 25 minutes since we all pronounced our names and said something about ourselves. So Don, before you say your last name, everyone try to remember how it's pronounced. Okay, Don, anything that you want to say about yourself, including how to pronounce your last name, go right ahead. Okay. It's Don Akshan. Um, it's, um, it's a Yiddish word that means incredibly stubborn. And, uh, <laughs> I could have told you that. And we don't and we don't know which ancestor earned it, but there you go. Um, and uh, I am enjoying aging very much. I feel like I earned it. And uh, I'm very positive about what's yet to come. And like Tim, I have discovered a lot of patience just from having lived and from having had things happen and have them all work out in the end it's it's a little reassuring so i think that's a nice a nice facet to to this age uh let me pass it on to uh charla i'm charla kenny joseph writer educator and pain science enthusiast and i didn't get to talk about pain today so Maybe you'll have me on another time. We can talk about pain and aging. I would love to. I didn't want anyone to feel obligated. They have to keep talking about aging. And I love it that you are so willing. Who do you, what, tell us one more thing about yourself, Sharla, anything, and then pass the baton. Ah. I just I just started a part time job at my local public library, so I'm learning lots of new things. Good. <laughs> it's not as simple as it looks. I and I pass it on to Tim. You say me? That's <laughs> you. Okay. Um, I thought that I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, and, and it's Tim McDonald, and I'm in Tampa, Florida again. And I think one thing that I haven't said about myself is that I just love meeting and connecting with other people. And I don't view it as aging. I view it as living. <laughs> yeah. I will pass it to Maxwell. So we don't go in the same order as we did that. Well, actually let me do Marion because she went last, last time. And then we will yeah. go last. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I don't That's mind. <laughs> All right, I'm Miriam Haugen, and and Haugen is a Norwegian name that I married, and um, and what else have I not have I not said? I I think yes, we should talk. About, I think that talking about pain would be very appropriate for this demographic. I'm mm -hmm. I'm pretty 
fortunate myself that I know that many in our in the aging group uh, do struggle with pain, and that that can just you know sap the life out of you. Um, what else? Um, I am really enjoying life. This is this is a wonderful time. I I feel like okay. there's just mm -hmm. the smorgasbord of so many things that I could do with my life right now, and I'm enjoying many things. So, all right, Maxwell. Well, so I seem to be at the opposite of the spectrum with you know not being retired or fully enjoying you know life and being able to do many. things. Things. So I'll give myself, uh, show you guys why I am passionate about aging and probably one of the reasons I'm here today. Um, when I was in college, I invented a fitted bed sheet that has layers. So each layer is waterproof and 100%, um, I'm sorry, incredibly soft and 100% waterproof. So I've learned there's some things that happen with age that aren't up to you, whether it's taking medicine or just getting older, where people become more and more incontinent and such. So it's a fitted bed sheet that has peel away layers. You simply just peel away the layers and you instantly have a brand new sheet below. And I didn't realize how big of a profound effect that a simple bed sheet um, could have with the caregiving community and the people being cared for. It gives people their dignity and independence back and allows caregivers to instantly change sheets um, without having to do an excessive amount of laundry. And you could change a sheet while somebody's in bed. And that's why I got so passionate about this community because everybody reaches out and everybody is wildly, stunningly nice um, when they find a product that's been really, really helpful for them. And so I've spoken to so many people about so many detailed things that happen um, as they get older. And I'm just happy to be a part of their journey. It's brilliant. Wow. 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 And great. I'm Christine A. Smith, the aging enthusiast. And what I would love to say is something about everything that you've said. I'm going to grab on the last one. It's easiest to remember. I am 62 and all these changes have happened at 62. I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm 63 because I'm really revving up here <laughs> with, with starting new stuff. I hate to disturb a person in pain and it could be other things like blood or spilled food in a bed and i know how to position i know how to do the rolling and then reposition <clears throat> how much better that they're not waiting for me to do that shoving at the last corner before they can finally settle again but i love that a person does not have to put up with something around them that reminds them of their pain or difficulties or um, whoops or whatever, uh, that they can just, oh, there's nothing like a nice clean bed to slip into as far as I'm concerned. So I appreciate that you started in college. Oh my of you just coming together with me today. I just, I just wanted to sit here and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I will simply say, I would love to have any of you come again. And this was so fun. We talked about Hollywood Squares. Thank you for being Paul Lind, Dawn, in <laughs> Hollywood Squares. Brady Bunch, for those who, like me, grew up only watching it for the first time. Here we are in our squares and we are all living. So I guess maybe I'm a living enthusiast. I, I think I could get more people on board with living enthusiast. Um, sometime we're going to talk about being a pain enthusiast. You guys were so wonderful. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you.